Hey everyone, this is Chris and Sandy Bent with the Chris and Sandy Show, where we get up close and personal with some amazing guests throughout the entertainment industry. And today, like I say on every show, we got a great one for you. Who do we have? We have Dave Hollis with us today. He is a dad living in a small town outside of Austin, Texas, where he spends his time as a New York Times bestselling author, host of the popular Rise Together podcast keynote speaker, small business consultant, performance coach, and runner turned fitness enthusiast. And we're going to talk about all that. Yes. The rise, the fall, and the redemption. Yes. So welcome to the Let's show. do it. Okay. Let's do it. Chris and Sandy, I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> you know, I usually start the show out kind of talking about how COVID affected, but that kind of goes into the part of the downfall. So I'll save that for later. Let's go back, way back. Um, tell us a little bit about how, you know, you were a Disney exec from what I understand. Um, how did that get started and where did that lead? Yeah. So I grew up in Southern California, uh, oldest of four kids had, uh, entertainment just as a part of what I thought I'd like to do in my life. So I went to college focused on communications, had this ambition at the time of becoming a broadcaster. I thought I'd be oh, wow. Dan Rather, or Peter Jennings, <laughs> something like that. And uh, just out of school, not knowing how to necessarily get into it, I was interning at Fox uh, while I was still in college, and it turned into the beginning of what would be about a 20-year run inside of the entertainment business. I, I worked wow. at Fox, I did some publicity after some research, moved into some talent management in, uh, in PR, but then also in uh, just helping to try and manage both uh, the, the people who are in front of the camera, but also people who are making music. Uh, and it led me to Disney, where I had a 17-year career. Wow. Uh, I started doing product management, uh, uh, basically the packaged media side of the business, where the DVD and VHS business was still a thing, uh, trying to put those products that were being created for the theater into stores. And, uh, and I worked in a bunch of different jobs. I was very, very lucky at the beginning of my career. I had 10 jobs in the first 10 years. Oh, wow. And uh, it was, yeah, not every job, uh, necessarily the job that I was most excited about, but <laughs> yeah. uh, every single time. Something was that a I was stepping stone. It was a stepping stone. It was also a chance to kind of like learn a new thing every once in a while, whether it was in technology or in retail, in sales. And I found myself in the position to be asked to jump into the sales role for the theatrical group oh, wow. uh, okay. about 10 years in. And that last seven years, I ran the sales division for the studio, putting movies into theaters, and it was just one of the greatest jobs ever in that, wow. you know, it's one of the most prolific intellectual pieces of property in the world in Disney. But during my tenure, there was the acquisition of Pixar, the acquisition of Marvel Studios, the acquisition of Lucasfilm. <laughs> and so over the course of time, man, you talk about having... Uh, some leverage with who you're selling things to or mm -hmm. the iconic things that people certainly, you know, from a consumer perspective, know and love. I mean, we had Star Wars and Avengers and everything else, and it was fantastic. And, and it was fantastic until uh, it was one of these things where I jumped into that sales job at 36. I had a predecessor who'd been there for almost 36 years. <laughs> and so I was drinking out of a fire hydrant in those first couple of years. And it was, um, it was just so exhilarating and uh, mm -hmm. triggered all of my insecurities, but I was learning so much and having to figure out wow. different new ways in how to take his kind of the pedigree that he had was very much, I've been here for so long. I've seen it so often, trust me. I am uh, going to tell you a piece of advice and you're going to take it because I've just been here. And yeah. for me, mm -hmm. it was, I'm going to build an analytics team and I'm going to try with some math and some data to uh, show you why the decisions that we need to make are smart. Not because I've seen it before, because I haven't, not because I know it so well, because I don't, but because the history of the business would suggest that this is the way to do things. And over those first three or four years of that seven year sales job, I started to develop better relationships with these bigger uh, filmmaking heads at each of these big studios. And it was, like I say, it was just extraordinary. And at the time that I was maybe three years in, I was hitting my 40th birthday. And there was something <laughs> interesting that was happening for me at 40, where I just started asking a bigger set of existential questions. Why the heck am I here? Is this, you know, is this, yeah. what, <laughs> is this what God's got for me? Is, is there, you know, maybe not a 
uh, a better use of, or, or, or I say even a different way. I, I was now, this time, were, all, were you already married to Rachel or you have ever had? You... Oh yeah. 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 So Rachel and I had been married already for quite a bit of time actually. Um, and so this was something that was just a part of, you know, our life. And, um, mm -hmm. and by the way, like, yeah, man, that job had so many cool perks. There were neat things that came <laughs> with access to, you know, whether it was Disneyland or premieres to movies or anything else. <laughs> so y'all um, were living it up. We were, we were living it up. We were living it up. And from the outside world, definitely, it was very much the, you know, like it was a dream job. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I still felt this thing there toward those last three years where the relationships that I was needing to build with the Steven Spielbergs of the world or mm -hmm. the way that I was having to do the work to try and get the best deals for the company, um, you know, selling Avengers and Star Wars movies to movie theaters who need them like oxygen became something, again, that just it didn't take as much effort necessarily. It was something that I had the best team in the world and the strongest intellectual property ever assembled at a studio. And so as I'm asking these questions, I actually was uh, out back with my kids. We had this ritual where we would uh, sit in the hot tub. I'd let them ask any question that could pop into their head. My three boys at the time were nine, seven, and four. And my middle son asked a very simple question. And it was, <laughs> What, what are you most afraid of? <laughs> and, <laughs> right? Like he's, he's looking for something silly or goofy because, man, this is a silly, goofy kind of thing that we usually played. And out of my mouth fell, not living up to my potential. And That's how I, I yeah. yeah, well, yeah. And so I think, you know, as much as it was something that I probably had some degree of consciousness of, it had never really come out of my mouth in that kind of way. And now that it was out, it created something of this realization, like, man, I think you might be living into your worst fear in real time in that mm -hmm. you're not having to necessarily work that hard to get these straight A grades. You're not having to necessarily use every gift that's been given. Because you're so used to it. Because you're so used to it. You're also surrounded by such abundance that, man, it, it did beg that question, huh, is this really the best use of what you have developed in experience or what you have in gifts given by God or whatever it might be? And if the answer ends up being no, do you have to then do something to change it to uh, to you know unlock something that is more like yeah. utilized yeah. potential? And so, uh, I started pursuing you know inside of the company. Hey, are there other things that I could do that might actually be you know that same experience I had in those first ten years? A new job that I don't know how to do that might have me that again drinking out of a fire yeah. hydrant, right? <laughs> and and uh, and those weren't materializing, and so I there at the end, after 17 great years, uh, made a big old leap to leave a career for what felt like something more of a missional calling to go try and do something good, but something that was terribly different and certainly not as certain jumping into entrepreneurship and, and doing some work with Rachel. I bet with y'all's rise, which we'll eventually get to, I bet Disney regrets like, oh, we should not have let him go. <laughs> Because, because again, you know, they have speakers and all that. They they have all that, and they had somebody right under their roof that had this potential that they, to me, I guess they didn't see. And ain't that always the case? You know, in this world, it's like um, I, I remember hearing a quote by somebody that where you'll you'll never be um, celebrated by people who who know you until you're celebrated by people who don't. Ooh, that's good. That's good. Well, it's interesting because this, you know, like I was fortunate. I was surrounded by some of the best leaders in the history of time, especially inside of the movie business. And I, they had, they represented their interest in me being there. They had just asked if they might extend a contract where I was committing myself to four more years worth of time. <laughs> and uh, in an interesting way, because of that feeling of, is this really the best place for me signing that contract? It was in uh, March, game. April of 2017. It actually was bizarrely a lower point because it wow. felt like I was yeah. committing myself to certainty or to predictability at the expense of growth. And I, and I just started really kind of diving into some of the kind of self-help stuff. And I, and I could see, man, there's this real connection between growth and fulfillment. And in the absence of that growth, I really was in the season of feeling stuck. So wow. I actually, wow. you know, wow. when when the decision to to make the leap ends up happening, you know, just before we started the show, we're talking about Nashville or Austin. Like <laughs> we started having a conversation about 
what what would it mean to leave this thing that you've known so well and to leave this company that has loved you being there so much mm -hmm. and uh and the decision to move the family was in part, hey, it would be for a small business. We got to find some place that can accommodate actually growing one in a mm -hmm. in a world where the you know cost of living and such in California was a little bit higher. <laughs> but also, you know, like realistically, if I was going to have to go and ask these people who I just suggested I was going to spend the next four years of time with, uh, hey, I'd like to not uh, stay here for that length of time. It felt like moving that family and having some distance from Hollywood would give yeah. me a little air yeah. cover in, in them, you know, saying it was okay. And oh, wow. so when when it ended up being the time to move, we we went just on an exploratory mission for what cities might be accommodating. Austin was the first one that we ended up checking out. We had this great dinner with uh, our friend Jen Hatmaker. We had this great breakfast the next morning with this charity we'd been involved with around foster care. And it felt like, oh, wow, this could, in fact, be a thing. And we ended up going just looking at neighborhoods with a real estate agent. It wasn't, a, oh, we're going to move. You know, it's not it wasn't even like, hey, we're out here to buy a house. And there was something about the place that I'm currently living in that mm. we walked onto mm -hmm. that property. And I was like, we got to figure out some way to buy this house today. Oh, wow. We can, like, oh, let, yeah. let's yeah. let's figure out how we're going to finance it. Let's figure out how we're going to logistically move the family. Let's you figure go, out how yeah. we're going to move. But. I had to commit myself to something that could give me so much leverage that I could get back to Disney and have the courage to actually ask them to let me out of that contract. Oh, wow. And so there it was, you know, we ended up, uh, you know, making an offer on and buying that house toward the end of 2017, waited till the first time I was back in the office in 2018 in January. And I went and had those conversations and those conversations, by the way, I was sleepless over for quite a bit of time because I didn't know how they were going to respond, but I also, it was scary to like speak out loud. Hey, I'm going to do this thing that is so unconventionally different. That is, you know, probably not going to make sense necessarily to you people who, you know, have uh, created a whole bunch of value out of this construct inside of which you live. And I am now <laughs> opting out of that construct and deciding to go <laughs> do something different. But um, the reception was honestly the best I, I, I had to, uh, go to my boss, but then ultimately to Bob Iger, who was the CEO at the time. And just as a like sign of how great a leader they 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 were, and and certainly Bob especially was. When I came to meet with Bob, he had already heard that I was you know coming into his office to ask if I you know might be able to leave my contract. And he said, "So I hear I hear there's an opportunity for you to go and do something new. I just have a single question: Is there anything I could do to convince you to stay?" <laughs> and I said, you know, uh, this is a decision that we've, you know, thought a lot about, prayed a lot about, made, you know, it, it's a big thing, but Bob, I'll tell you what, we made this choice and we're going to go do this. And he said, well, great. We've got 30 minutes on the books for this calendar, uh, on, the, on the calendar for this meeting. Why don't you sit down and tell me about what you're going to go do for the next 28 so that I can celebrate you and encourage you as you go. Oh, and I was like, gosh, that is the thing you hope for in a great wow. leader, that they might have a vested interest in your success and your career even if it isn't inside the company that you've uh, you know served for 17 years. So um, the Disney time was such a great time, but also, it, you know, it, it's, it was a time, it was a time that had uh, reached its end, even yeah. if it, you know, yeah. again, was received by uh, a lot of incredulous looks. You're going to go do what? Uh, you're going to go do <laughs> it where? You're going to go do it with who? Like, you know, it didn't make a ton of sense to, to them necessarily. And remember when um, God calls you, it never makes sense to people who he didn't call. Yeah, well, I think too. I just uh, was was blogging about this. Uh, I'm, unbelievably, I'm a blogger now. Uh, <laughs> I <just laughs> joke about it, um, but I I do think what's interesting is it felt like a calling for the rest of my life, right? And so I know mm. we're going to talk about what happens after the leap. <laughs> but uh, you know, spoiler alert: had I known that this thing that I thought I was leaving a career for was a thing that would have a two year shelf life. <laughs> Oh. It would not have been a thing that felt like a calling worth pursuing, <laughs> right? And so I think sometimes there's there's such a blessing in not knowing exactly yep. how things will unfold when you feel the call in the first place or you feel drawn into something new. Because if you knew how hard it was going to be or how short-lived something might be or whatever it ends up being, uh, it just might not have been a thing that I, it's you know, 
I'm so grateful every single day. I don't look back. I mean, every once in a while, I'll play a little sliding doors game. What if I were still there? What job? And might it's I probably have? when you're and you and you probably think about it most when you're on shows like this, where you have to go back and talk about something. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it's like I am so <laughs> grateful for every single thing that exists in my life, and so much more for who I am relative to the guy I was wearing a mm-hmm. suit every single mm-hmm. day. I am unrecognizably different. And I would not be this version of who I am now where I still work in there. It's just a 0% chance. It is not a thing that could, you know, could happen unless I was, you know, in a place where I had to grow as much as I've had to out of the things that happened after the departure. Um, And so there's just, there's a gratitude for feeling the call, but also not knowing the details of what. Now now you're talking about not knowing and all that. That's like with this show. When we launched this show, um, we lo- it really was just it was we launched um, back in t- 2020 in January, so before COVID. But we launched as a up and coming country music um, interview show because a lot yeah. of our contacts are in Nashville and stuff. So that yep. was kind of the roots of the show. And I'll be honest, like you said, um, if I would have known then what I know now of how hard it would be to do a show like this, that we would we would be at almost 600 interviews in just a couple of years and how much work that yeah. is. And yeah. for the show to not have branded itself to make a lot of money yet, we're still growing. Um, I don't know if I would have launched, <laughs> but now yeah. that we have and that we're where we are and we have people like you coming on and Randy Travis and Sarah Evans and so many other big people coming on, we're like, well, I'm thankful that we did launch, but I don't think I would have. Yeah. I just, I, I, I have a daughter. Her name's Noah. She's amazing. Five. Uh, she was the uh, end of us completing our family and that she's adopted. And uh, after having had three biological kids, we decided, Hey, we're going to adopt a, a, a daughter. And it mm-hmm. felt because at the time we'd read this book by Jen Hatmaker called interrupted. Uh, we had a couple at our church that had themselves uh, adopted through Ethiopia. You know what? We're going to adopt through Ethiopia. Let's go. And for about a year's worth wow. of time, we were inside of this of this Ethiopian adoption program and this track and all the paperwork and it, just everything. And then because of some circumstances on the ground in Africa, it was no longer a program that was open. It was like, okay, we felt called into this space. This door has now wow. been closed. Does this now mean that we're not supposed to be on this track in the first place? Nope. We're going to keep walking forward because it felt mm-hmm. like, hey, you know what? We're, we're here. We were called here. We're going to be here. We then got this urge, this instinct to, hey, you know, let's let's look into foster care, right? A thing that we knew nothing about, but had, again, a couple of church who'd themselves been foster parents. And uh, they, because of the uh, foster to adopt program, had had the, a child of, in care that ultimately became adoptable and became a part of their, their family forever. Okay, maybe that's our path. Let's go. And so mm-hmm. we went into this program and learned how to be. I mean, there's a lot of training that you have to do to be able to have a house that's ready for foster care. Mm-hmm. And uh, in 2016, we had uh, a placement, 11 month old baby girl. She came in, little birdie, and uh, it was a short term placement as a prerequisite for being a, eligible for the adoption part of the program. And turned out she had a sister. She was 22 months old. She was in not in care, but in a in a holding facility of some kind. I said, hey, huh. you want to take her sister mm-hmm. too? Yes, we would love to have her sister here. We can accommodate her sister. So now we have two children, <laughs> one just under one, one just under two. They were there just for a few months, but yeah. uh, it was not a thing that we had as a part of what we thought was going to happen in our journey that, hey, we could have two kids in care. Yeah. And now we're, you know, we've satisfied that prerequisite for, okay, now you're ready for the adoption part of the foster to adoption journey. And about a month went by after they returned to their biological parents and the phone rings and it's an emergency placement worker who says, hey, we've got these twin girls, four days old, abandoned at the airport. Wow. Because your house, of all the houses, is one of the only ones in LA County that is qualified to handle two children under two, <laughs> uh, right? A thing that oh, wow. wasn't, wasn't a part of our plan. We didn't sign up to have two kids, it just, yeah. but it felt ordained. It was like, oh my goodness, this is the thing, mm-hmm. you know? And he said, like, hey, we, we'd love to have this happen because tomorrow, day five, we will split these girls up and put them into separate homes oh, wow. if you want to keep these kids together. Uh, but also we have got, we got about 20 minutes. You got to make a decision in 20 minutes or else, <laughs> oh, uh, you know, like that's, that's a big decision big, to make. That's a big decision. That's a big prayer in a short amount of time. Right. So we said, yes, let's do this. Okay. And the next day we went and got the smallest car seats at target. We showed up at the hospital. We named these girls and we brought them home. And for 
six, seven weeks. It was beautiful and hard and sleepless and leading them <laughs> off of the drugs. They were like, it was a thing. It was a thing. It was a thing. And then we got a phone call that, uh, unfortunately, the emergency placement worker who'd called us that first day had misrepresented their adoptability. It turned out that there was a biological part of family that was now in play, interested in custody. And of course, like that's the goal of foster care. Yeah. And so right. like, mm-hmm. so couldn't be happier that like there is an ability for girls to be with biological family, but also uh, it was just devastating. Y'all were was crushed. Gutting. We were crushed. Mm-hmm. We thought that the, we had a vision for what our family was going to look like for the rest of time. And that rug pull now had snatched what, you know, I could see walking girls down the aisle was going to look like, you know, in 25 years worth of time. And so I see, I tell the story because I started with, I got a five-year-old daughter named Noah and she is one of the brightest parts of my entire life. We ended up after this experience, deciding to just continue to trudge through in what ultimately ended up being private adoption. But if I'd have known, if we'd have known that Ethiopia was going to not be a thing because of having invested a year's worth of time, paperwork, frustration, phone calls, whatever mm-hmm. else. If foster care, which has just become a passion of my life, I'll spend time trying to support that system for the rest of time and in some ways to try and honor the experience that we had with mm-hmm. those twins. But if I'd have known that we were going to have this uh, experience, there's no way I would have ever decided to or felt yeah. called yeah. into uh, you know, finishing our family with this uh, with this daughter that we have now, and, and that, those you know, other like, twins, cry about that. Ooh. You know, the twins and the foster <laughs> and all that that led you to here because if those didn't happen, that wouldn't happen. Yeah, and I would even say this, you know, like I, at the time when you're like kind of on your knees screaming to the sky, like why is this happening? You know, <laughs> I, the only thing I the only thing I can kind of like think at this time is one, it created and galvanized a real passion for supporting foster care, a thing that man, I'm super involved in every single day right now with an organization called National Angels. So um, good, it kind of like lit a fire in my belly to try and support something that needs a lot of support. But also, I think going through that hard season in some ways was preparatory. Like it was giving me some tools and how to handle going through really, really hard things that nobody should want to or have to go through. The times when life ain't fair and, uh, you know, the things that you pray for are being answered in ways that are, you know, completely different than the way you would have necessarily had them answered. And so, um, you know, I look back with some gratitude, bizarrely, for those hardest seasons for, you know, reminding me how strong we as a family unit could be going through something tough because uh as it turns out of course we had a lot of tough stuff that ultimately ended up coming you know in the years that you had more tough coming that's right (laughs) and i'm not done with it now so good news is i'm I'm prepared for whatever comes next (laughs) Um, so let's move to okay now you're settling down you've got this great marriage. How did your marriage become your, you know, Sandy and I are married and, you know, with the show, we named it Chris and Sandy show. Our whole marriage, our whole time has kind of been our, people know us, they know us as the married couple and all that kind of like with y'all. And that's why I wanted you to come on. Cause I, I, you know, even though that we'll get to the point of the fall, um, I think it's so important to fall because I think other couples that are branding their marriage can get something out of this to say, you know, um, some red flags I'd better look for as we rise, because there are things that are there that that maybe you didn't see then that you look back and like, well, maybe there were some. So let's talk about how did the rise, you know, how did y'all pick to be speakers and all that? What led you into your company? Yeah. So. My ex-wife had a company for eight, nine years worth of time. Mm-hmm. Well, we were still in LA. I'm still, I'm working at Disney. She's kind of tinkering with and figuring out what kind of community that she's building, what kind of yeah. business she's yeah. building. And, uh, you know, in some ways it was, you know, reflective of different seasons and stages she was in in her own life. So when she's a new mom, she's serving more content that's about being a new mom and the things that yeah. you do with small kids when she's... Mm-hmm you know, getting into personal development, it starts making a turn into, hey, I'm learning these things that are changing the way that I think about growth or the way that I think about becoming a better person. And I want to share these things. And when we made the decision to jump from Disney, what's like crazy now for me to even like contemplate as a super practical, pragmatic person, (laughs) Uh, you know, 
the, the, the book that she wrote that would become a big juggernaut for a lot of the success of the company hadn't come out yet. Uh, Girl, Wash oh, Your yeah. Face was this, uh, you know, this, you know, unicorn, uh, you know, you in a still wasn't kind of sure that your decision was the right decision. You, you felt right, but it was like the success wasn't there yet. So you were coming in. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, at the, at the time when we were having the conversation, I had been, you know, certainly supportive, you know, as a partner in yeah. conversation yeah. and in business strategy, supportive financially, but uh, there wasn't necessarily proof yet that this was a concept that was going to work. And <laughs> so it, it was, it was in so many ways, just, Hey, I've got a lot of belief in the yeah. way that you have been doing this work and the connection that you have with this community and the hope that I have for the way that this book that has not yet come out can have some impact on the trajectory of what this, you know, ultimately looks like. And so when we jumped in, we, you know, like, I had that conversation with Disney in January. Girl, Wash Your Face ends up coming out in February. And we don't move our family to Texas until the end of May, early June. Wow. Well, by the time we move, you know, like the book hadn't yet, you know, kind of become what it did. But it, there were definitely signs of, oh, man, we're cooking with gas here. There's, there's something. Here. Yeah, yeah there, there, there's, some, there's something here. And so, you know, the role, the, the original conversation of, hey, what if we were to come together was, born out of this idea of there's a great book called rocket fuel. If you're in a partnership or business and you're wondering, Hey, like what pieces might you need to try and create uh, a fantastic rocket ship? Um, you need to have a visionary, someone who can cast the what, and you need to have an integrator, an operator that can figure out the how. And so she was very much the visionary and the, and the what person <laughs> I want to go do that. And I was very much the how person. Okay. Like what's the puzzle? How do we put the pieces together? How do we solve this thing and try and make it work as well as we can? And by pulling these, uh, you know, things together, it was like the Avengers in sor of sorts. Uh, we've each got our, our superpowers. We're going to come together and be a stronger unit because of the combination of those powers. And we did. And we had the benefit, again, of, you know, some, some pieces of it, the relationships and connections that I had inside of the business that I'd been working in, in entertainment for a long period of time, some of the ways that I could take things that, happened at Disney or other companies that I've worked at and apply them to this now small business. And, and some of them, the, you know, the way that what she was creating, whether it was a book or speaking mm -hmm. or whatever else was resonating and connecting yeah. with an ever growing yeah. audience. And we were just pouring gas on a fire at that point because <laughs> there was just, <laughs> it was know, just one exploding. Thing it just, it, 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 no one could have predicted that things were going to happen. And you know, that's something that I think a lot of people miss. You know, you have a lot of speakers that get on there um, and speak out there and talk about it's always what you do and the work ethic and all that. Something we've learned by interviewing 600 people and, and a lot of them um, are at the top of their game. One thing we've learned is that from the looks of it, it takes, of course, a hardcore work ethic. You work, 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 some great connections and a little bit of luck. Yeah, and I would say a lot those of luck. Three. I, to be honest, I'm, I'm going to say a lot of luck, too, because like, <laughs> and, and I, I agree. And the thing is, like, yes, you, it's it's work, but like it is so many times proximity to someone who can be the key that unlocks something that you yeah. couldn't have yeah. even you know known or being a part of a mastermind where you're sitting inside of a small group of people where they've already all made a bunch of mistakes that you're going to make unless you listen to them and get a fast pass to not have to make every single one of them. But a lot of it ends up being, man, you know, there, there are a lot of things that could have been created, but this was the thing that she knew would ultimately resonate with a community that she'd been engaged with for a decade's worth of time. Mm -hmm. Just couldn't have imagined, though, that it was going to tip into something that would connect as big as it ended up connecting. You know, like, shoot, that book ended up selling about five million copies that first year. That's wildly beyond what anyone could have possibly <laughs> conceived of. And that, man, that just gives air cover for having a whole bunch of fun trying to figure out how to ultimately <laughs> take other parts of the business and make it work. So, you know, we all were at a different point. You know, a lot of people that are trying to build, 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 build. But this explosion made it where... It happened. So now you're trying to figure out how to pull it together. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I think, you know, like it's important, I think, too, to point out, right, the the decision to jump in and do the company and mm. the quote unquote explosion, as it were, makes it feel 
or C maybe on the outside as you know something of a kind of an overnight success. Yeah, but I do want to give credit yeah. to right. It's a decade's worth of time that Rachel was spending inside of this community that she'd been yeah. building. It's two decades worth of time that I'd been spending inside of entertainment. There and were even y'all's, and even y'all's marriage. When you look at it, you know er, everything that she wrote in the book that resonated came from um came from her eyes being married. That's true. So, That's true. So, so it, you know, it really, you know, it, I know a lot of people don't think about that way when they have authors who are a, a spouse that's big author, but the, but you don't really see the spouse. Um, it technically it's all of them because when she's writing, she's writing from a point of view. That's not a single person. She's writing from a point, from a point of view, from a mother, from a wife, from all this. And that's what resonated. That's real. No, that's real. And, I, you know, I think, too, what you realize, especially in the work that I've, I've been doing and, and that we did prior to it being just me, like there are so many universal things that exist in humanity in just us as being people. There's a messiness that all of us have access to. There is just, you know, in our humanity, there are so many universal truths. And so finding a way to write about any of those things, whether there are fears or insecurities or shame or whatever, in a way that normalizes that as a thing that doesn't just happen to you, the reader, but to all of us, including me, the author, is part of what I think has made her work or my work or our work a thing that ends up connecting. And, uh, you know, I think in part, you know, the social media world contorts so much of what we all believe to be normal in this highlight reel, you know, people are basically taking their highlights and putting them on social, not necessarily showing all of the real raw, honest truth of what it means to be human or struggle with whatever it is that they're struggling with. And so finding a way to just kind of cut through some of that curated ridiculousness and offer something that feels like I say, like a normalizing agent. Hey, you know, if you're going through something hard, it's okay. We're all going through something hard. If you're struggling mm-hmm. with something, guess what? It's okay. Like, I, I'm I'm leading out right now. Like, I am a mess. I mean, <laughs> I'm I'm an awesome mess, but like, I'm a mess. And like my my messiness, if if you know, but your mess is your message. Talking about it, yeah. But like, talking about it is part of what I think hopefully makes someone feel okay and, and normal on the days when it gets hard. So, see, I went through 19 years of addictions myself. And the first five years of our marriage was really hectic on her because, but she was always my cheerleader. She was always uplifting. She never put me down, never nagged me through those rough times. And, um, and I believe that she was able to stay because most women would have left in those early years. I believe she stayed because we both realized that God brought us together for a reason. We, and she felt that in her heart that there was a reason we're together because we've got this whole crazy story and how we met and all that. But he brought us together for a reason and she knew this. And so I think that that made her stay a little bit longer than most women would have. And then December, you know, 26, 2007, I felt like God said, it's over. It's time, you know, and he, and I've been sober ever since. Oh, that's amazing. Love that. I love that. I mean, I'll, we, we, we can jump into this too. I mean, like I, myself, I, this year has been, a year of a reset, another year of a reset. I mean, you know, it's like, I, I don't know how many resets they're going to be, but like, I'm, I'm in another, I'm in another one. I, I had just, man, a really hard end of last year. There were some really wildly interesting things that were triggered around the release of my second book, mm-hmm. the, the book coming out after our marriage, after the, the company wow. that man, just, I, I was drinking more than I wanted to drink. And I, I had, I got up just after the new year and I was just like, no, this is not, I can't, I'm sorry. Like, this is not a long-term sustainable plan. This isn't me showing up the best as I want as a dad or as mm-hmm. a partner, or as a human, I want to look myself in the mirror and be proud. I ended up going into treatments at the beginning of this year. Oh, wow. And man, it was just the hardest thing. It was just so I had so much shame and I didn't like having to admit that I needed help. But I didn't like then you had to go back and relive not just that moment, but relive everything that's happened again. Oh, yeah. And what's interesting is what I you know, what I didn't appreciate until I was actually inside of this amazing eight weeks. I mean, it's of all the decisions of my life. It's one of the most important (laughs) and things I am so proud of on the other side. Um, There was so much. In, in drinking that was about running from or muting the things I didn't want to, have to turn around and look at. And the treatment window really was an invitation to sit, turn around and face all of the things, including the stuff 
um, that happened in marriage, after marriage, in the build of the company, after the fall of the company, like all of those things um, in a way that allowed me to make peace in so many ways, to honor the feelings that existed around all of those things. Um, but also, you know, like in so many ways, alcohol for me was a symptom of unresolved, unprocessed stuff oh, yeah. that that treatment windows, <laughs> it was as much for mental health as it was for, for, for booze. Was unresolved and so pain that you had. It was, yeah. You know, it was, it was unresolved pain. I, I, I say this in a way that I hope doesn't make light of it, but like alcohol for me was very much a solution more than it was a problem. Like 95% yeah. of the time yeah. I was taking care of not, you know, not it was masking feel, over the problem. It was masking a thing. It was, you know, like ha- helping me not to, you know, feel as scared or whatever, whatever it was. Um, but it came at, you know, at, at the expense of me actually getting to heal, actually getting to work, actually getting to confront things that, mm-hmm. you know, needed to be confronted. So, um, you know, I feel great about that decision. I'm, you know, whatever, five talking about and a healing, half months in, but you know, it's, it's, I don't have you, I don't have your time yet, but, you know, talk about the healing aspect. Um, let's go back now and you're at the top of the world. COVID happened. The whole year just changed everything for you. Uh-huh. What, what, what did you think happened when it happened? And what do you think happened now? You look back. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Uh, by the time COVID happened, we'd had kind of 18 months of just an unprecedented esque run. I don't know that, again, we could have possibly even conceived of what it was to have, you know, really uh, movies and theaters, books at number one, the mm-hmm. stages that were as full in arenas with people, you know, at, at three and four day events. It was, it was an extraordinary thing. And when we got to the end of 2019, um, I'd actually taken a step away from the company, which is, um, you know, not, it wasn't, oh, wow. it was not, uh, oh, I have a, a an omniscient of, uh, uh, there's going to be a, a big pandemic coming. I have no concept of this. Um, but there were a couple of things that were happening. I, um, as a part of just a broader, longer conversation, like some of what the company had as its ambition was, yes, to put tools into hands for people that might help them to have a better, fuller, richer life. Yeah. Um, but we also needed a business that didn't solely depend on Rachel being the deliverer of the message because uh, you can't pass, pass the old bus test if that ends up being a thing. And so we'd uh, created something of a podcast network with a variety of different people. My buddy Trent Shelton was in there, guy and gal named Wade, uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who was there. We had we had five or six different shows of different people. Yeah. We now have yeah. these events, we're on stage. We had a bunch of different people speaking. And I've been in a, in, a, in a space where, man, I'm now feeling like, hey, I've got something to say as well. I, yeah. you know, went to school early on. I, we started the show with this, like, I You've feel got like a I'm on this planet. To, I, I'm, I feel like I'm on this planet to be in, broadcasting or this like desire to be Dan rather, you know, kind of feeling and reporting maybe is going to look a little bit different for me than it was when I was, you know, 19, 20, 21. And maybe it's about books instead of sitting behind a desk and talking about news. And, um, and of all the things, I I mean, I put this in my last book, but I end up having this God experience on an airplane where I am of all things sat next to Dan rather himself (laughs) in on the plane, I break every ounce of cool protocol. I 100% immediately like lean over. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm a huge fan. I mean, like to give you a sign of how nerdy I was growing up. It's like my childhood idol. idol. I mean, like I was just, I was geeking out and he was so generous with his time. We talked for know, two hours with the time. It was unbelievable. Did he know who you were? Didn't know who I was. Wouldn't know. <laughs> didn't know. I'm glad it's, it, I'm not, I'm not anyone to know who's your Dan rather, but <laughs> the beautiful thing was I got off and I felt like, oh, man, this is some confirmation that, yeah, you oh, are wow. supposed to be a reporter, but reporter is going to look a little bit, little bit different for you. Yeah. And so um, so in some respects, I pulled away from my day to day duties at the company uh, in December of 2019 because I had a book that was coming out in March. I had, uh, mm-hmm. you know, a wow. coaching that was happening for the first time. I was doing some other things inside of podcasting. And so um, I was, you know making something of a more deliberate uh, transition into being a kind of forward facing face of the company than I had been in the past as the integrator operator trying to figure out the how. Was that awkward for you? Because I know all all your life you've been kind of the back person, whether it was Disney and all that. And here it is, you're about to launch into being an author. 
being podcasts, be you know, being coaching. So all of a sudden, you're going to be the forefront, just like your wife at the time was. Was that how did that feel? I mean, what did yeah? What did you say? Well, I, I mean, awkward is probably a good word, and uh, <laughs> and, and, sh- and like at the forefront, it maybe misrepresents it a little bit because I think part of why it was awkward, right? At the time, now you know, by t- the end of 2019. Rachel had back-to-back number one New York Times best-selling books, and we were selling out these arenas. Like I wasn't, uh, you know, on her level. Yeah. But I was, I was trying now to figure out where, like, what role I had or how I could play a part mm-hmm. inside of, you know, uh, inside of her shadow is the only way I can kind of say it because, <laughs> man, she cast a very, very big shadow, and. It's it was complicated. I'll be t- you know like just in like full candor, like it was complicated because I felt like you know man, if I could do this work and it could be helpful, and I can come from a perspective where I'm more of a skeptic to these things that we've been teaching, that now is like more of a believer because of having pushed past my skepticism, and I'm not wired like she is. I, I'm not as motivated as she is. Maybe I could. <laughs> You know, represent because something she can of a spark a stage. Yeah, no, and and I, you know, I love to get up on stage too. And we just we're different. We're just different, different, different. Um, but man, it's like it's hard because I didn't know where my place was. Yeah, um, yeah. And it was hard too because the you know the other reason to kind of step away from the business was it felt like in some ways um, us working together in the midst of the kind of success that we were having was it was creating strain in our marriage. Wow. It was hard wow. for us to, um, to to know when we stopped working and when we started our family time. And uh-huh. it was hard in, in success. Um, it was really hard for us to have conversations and have an ability to each feel- Because there's a lot of hurt. pressure when you're at the top. Yeah. yeah. And so part of my, hey, I'm gonna I'm a pull back. I'm gonna step away, I, you know. I was originally CEO, and then I uh, handed that back to her. Hey, you be CEO, I'll be COO. And then I stepped away from being COO, and I was like, I'm just going to be someone who writes books and uh, you know serves the company as a quote unquote personality, as opposed mm-hmm. to somebody who's you know managing uh, the CFO or the you know products team or anything yeah. else. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be over here, and of course, like I'll still come to meetings if you need and want me to, but. Um, and at the time, I'll be honest, like I didn't see that decision as a thing that was a predictor. There was no foreshadowing sense for me that, oh, man, your marriage is in trouble. I thought I was just doing oh, something that was smart for the preservation of it. Like, I'd still like to make out with you. So maybe if we don't work together all the time, that's mm-hmm. a thing that can actually <laughs> happen here or there. Um but I also was excited about starting to do the new the new work. The question though was about COVID, and you know, it's like mm-hmm. here we are. I've got a book tour that's going to you know be launching this first book of mine. Uh, we're really excited about some events that, of course, are happening in these big arenas. And COVID made all of that pause, like it did for the rest of the world. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Gave us time to think, but also I think gave us permission to think about doing things in a completely different way because of the rules, the book, the you know whatever it was that was applied to the world we used to live in was now less relevant. And so, um, in a world where man, we said we'd never do a digital version of the live event, there was a live event that was you know very very successful in April of uh of 2020 and then in may of 2020 we had a conversation about divorce and wow. um it wasn't you know it wasn't a long conversation it wasn't something that we'd been necessarily talking about um i was asked a couple of very very simple questions on a monday and uh, we had what a conversation were those about questions? Divorce. um i mean the first big question was do you think you can be the man that god created you to be married to me Wow. Oh, Which is a very big question. Yeah. That's very a big huge question. <laughs> huge question. And, uh, I, and I'll be honest, like it wasn't something I'd necessarily ever given any kind of time or thought to. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, the floor fell out from under me in having to kind of wrestle with the answer because mm. of the second question, which was, what's your primary identity? Wow. What is your primary identity? And my primary identity was husband to her. 
And mm. her primary identity was CEO of the company. Yeah. So and, that's kind of, and not yeah. wife to you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, it would have worked, I guess, if it had been, if, you, you know, your primary identity was husband to her and her pri primary identity was wife to you, then that could still work. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what's interesting is now, like, I can appreciate that, you know, uh, you know, a lot of work in therapy is still going to work on me <laughs> for the rest of the time. You know, yeah. there, there's some, there's, there's some interesting uh, stuff that I'm still working through in codependence that like, I'm not sure that you know, husband to her should be a primary identity. It just mm. was the answer because it was what I was, um, you know, at least for those last three years in service of, you know, hey, I'm going to leave my career to help build your, our company. Um, but I really do, I can say like in retrospect, you know, I can see that, you know, the decision to go jump and do the work, I was very committed to and had passion for the vision. Mm. And I was really a believer in this idea that, impact and pouring resources and serving people well through impact was very much going to be the thing that could allow me to get out of that funk where it didn't yeah. feel like yeah. my, you know, but I also know that that vision and that impact wasn't necessarily my vision. It wasn't necessarily the work that I was doing in its impact as much as supporting her was creating it, some of the impact. Oh, yeah. um, and so like, knowing now, oh, wow, like I was in service of helping support her vision. I thought that that was, you know, my job as husband or my job as partner. My job as someone who wanted to, um, you know, do as much as I could to serve as many people as I might be able to. And I still think that that can be true, but it can't come at the expense of losing yourself or losing your identity in that service. And so, um, the, it was tough. We had those two, it was a two, you know, two questions, two days. It was like a Monday and a Tuesday. And, um, that Friday was our anniversary, our 16th anniversary. We, uh, went wow. to celebrate our anniversary, got up the next morning and had a conversation. And it was, you know, like it was such a hard conversation because I had never honestly, and I guess I'm naive for not ever having ever, I just had never, ever considered that it, it was a possibility. And maybe there's a cautionary warning for anyone like, it, you know, you know, kind of love into and live into and tend to and cater to um, the service of your marriage as though it could be a possibility so that it never is. I, you know, like I wish I could give myself yeah, that advice like for, us for years since 2010. Once, you know, 2007, you know, I got sober and then a few years we kind of stagnated in the marriage. It just and then 2010, we started back at church and all that. But since then, we, you know, we've probably invested close to 10,000 hours into our marriage through marriage studies, sermons, yeah. um, retreats, um, yeah. conferences and all of that. Yeah, so we of pour that. as much into our, in fact, I've, you know, there have been times to where I've been offered to, for other opportunities, but it would have split us. So mm. like, no, not doing it. You know, we, we have struggled financially because we have this, that we want to be together. Yeah. And, and I and, and again, I would rather struggle and us build something together than uh, become successful and it splits us apart. I'm here for this. Yep. Totally agree. <laughs> totally, totally agree with you. So as all that's going, you get, you know, you get the divorce or at least the announcement, I guess, from Rachel was made out there. What were some of the thoughts and stuff people were saying on both sides. I'm talking not just the good, but even the ugly. What were people saying around y'all during, because I know 2020 had to be really rough. Not, I mean, you already felt guilty. How did uh, what other people were saying because you were in the spotlight make yeah. you feel more guilty? Yeah. Well, I mean, divorce is terrible. I hope nobody ever has to get a divorce. Uh, it's just one of the worst things on the planet. And uh, public divorce is the only thing that's worse than divorce <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because um, everybody you know, has an opinion. Everybody's got an opinion. You know, one of the things that was beautiful about the business that we had, I forget business, the community that we were engaged in. I mean, we were doing, you know, a, an hour, 45 minutes or so every single morning, Monday through Friday for two and a half years in community with people on a live that created intimacy people felt mm -hmm. as they i think should have like we were friends that um that they knew us wow. and so like the feelings that i had of rug pull and surprise were shared <laughs> by this community of people that um felt like they'd been uh, bamboozled that like somehow 
Um, the thing yeah. that they thought that they knew was just was, was just smoke and mirrors. And, and I and it wasn't and it wasn't. And I also like I understand like I understand people being frustrated because I was frustrated or being hurt because I was hurt. And um, and I also, um, you know, like it's easy to say like, oh, man, I, I wish that you could. I wish that there were some way to create something of an empathy bridge that might allow you to understand how. Um, it compounds the feeling that not only am I, you know, like feeling the grief of a marriage ending, but also the weight of disappointing a community and the then kind of frustration that bubbles up from mm -hmm. their very, their very justified feeling in all of it. But um, it just, you know, it all happened as it needed to, to create what now sits on the other side of it. I, I, I don't know that I could have, appreciated in May. So May 30th of 2020 was this conversation, you know, May 30th of 2022 just happened, you know, last weekend, two weekends ago. And I uh, was sitting here Memorial day surrounded by people that I love having had some amazing time with my family, having some awesome experiences with new friends. I don't know that I could have appreciated how happy I could, could be two years removed from what was just the hardest thing in my entire life. But part of, the happiness was born out of a lot of the, res the just the resilience or the the kind of the, the growth that comes inside of having to just keep putting one foot in front of the other during that super hard and dark season at the end of something great. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I I had written in the in this second book of mine the story of you know asking like what of my life needed to die in order that mm -hmm. I might be brought back mm -hmm. to life right like wow. there's this reference to, to Lazarus and. And how much, you know, that story doesn't even matter unless he dies in the first place. And as much yeah. as I, right, like I have such an appreciation and gratitude for who I am now, not anywhere near where I'm going to be. I'm still a stinking mess. I already told you that. And also, <laughs> we I, all like, yeah, we, we all are. are. Yeah, no, we all are. And, um, and, and I'm also, I'm just, I, I can see such growth and I can see such, um, there's just so many things that happen because of things having to die. Ego died, identity died, marriage died, business died, you know, and not that they, die, you know, like I still have a relationship with Rachel. There's still a business yeah. that yeah. she, she's running. Like there's there, it, but they died in the form that they had been in. So right. they could be, be reborn different, yeah. in new and better in different ways. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that I had an identity die, it gave way to, it gave permission for a new identity to be born. And so um, I'm grateful for those deaths. I don't like having to experience them because any death is tough, but man, I'm grateful for them having- I you love know, that having what you exist. said a while ago. And, and you know, when you're rising for success, this is, I, I'm gonna have to use this, but you had to figure out what had to die so that you could live. And that, that, and no matter what you're going after in life, you know, when you're chasing that dream, there's going to be some relationships that's got to die. And, you know, you can't, you know, you know, look at MC Hammer. You know, he was on top of the world. He brought his whole neighborhood with him and he went bankrupt because he didn't. If he, you know, if he'd have let some of that die, who knows? He might still be doing what he, you know, today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is, you know, I am, I got to, and I want to tread really lightly and carefully in this because I got, I'm trying to hold two things at the same time. Yeah. Right? yeah. I know the answer to the question, can I be the man that I was meant to be married to her? And I don't think that I could have become yeah. all of who I am intended to be inside of that relationship. Wow. And I also hate the idea of divorce. I would have fought every day for the rest of my life to stay married. Yeah. So and so those things, those things conflict. And I, and I don't know how to, I don't know how to reconcile them. I don't know how, you know, I don't, I don't know, but I do know um, that some, in some ways, the like redefinition of our relationship and the way that our family unit now looks and the way that I am outside of it on my now individual path, she is on hers. We're healthier. We're better, we're stronger mm -hmm. than we were. I have a like renewed sense of who I will ultimately be and become 
that in so many ways was born in the death of our marriage. And so oh, I, yeah. right. I don't, I'm not, again, I'm not an advocate for it. I don't, oh, yeah. but <laughs> I, I also, I, I, but I also can receive that, man, there's going to be some abundance that comes out of a yeah. circumstance that I wouldn't yeah, until like, you get Jews there, Until you get, you know, there's a lot of people that preach, you know, that, you know, you should stay married no matter what. And, but they've never been through that. Like I, you know, I, this is my second marriage with her. And we're about to come up on 20 years married. And the first one was not healthy, not because of my ex, but because of me. I was not healthy. I was still, I mean, of course, that was the yeah. start of all those addictions and lasted for many years. So there was, I was not going to be changing way back then. That was for sure. Yeah. So yeah. that had to, she had to end it because if she didn't, you, you know, it was going to destroy her. It's destroyed her mentally because of the way I was, but it was going yeah. to destroy her way more than that if she stayed. So she had to leave and and all that. Um, but at the same time, you know, people don't understand that unless you're there, you'll yeah. never understand what a marriage. I mean, I think I heard a definition one time. Marriage can either be um, heaven on earth or hell on fire. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and it's not that and again even if it's hell on fire it's not necessarily meaning that you're fighting you're this you're that sometimes it's just dead yeah. and there's nothing and there's no spark there's no nothing there and that's almost worse with no you know i'd almost rather have the passion the fiery passion than the fully dead you yeah. know because the fully well, dead yeah like, <laughs> Yeah. What's interesting, you know, like we didn't fight. We didn't, there wasn't, there wasn't, there wasn't like a big thing. It was yeah. just a thousand yeah. little ones. But yeah. I think also Which there was up. just, right. Like there was, you know, that, that difference in kind of like focus and, 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 and whether or not building and, you know, like the company was going to be a thing to, to spend, you know, all any, you know, time on versus, you know, shared interests or whatever it might be like, at a certain point, if there's misalignment, there's misalignment. And it wasn't, yeah. again, like, oh, my goodness, there, there was just, a, you know, a huge thing. It was just a thousand little ones. And I, yeah. and I to be honest, I don't know that I even had the objectivity to see all of them until yeah. I was until outside now. in the same and way that now. I'm and sure really everybody until is. Until we have and all that. Yep. Yep. Sit with all those feelings, look them all dead in the eye, naked in front of them. And it's uh, now a thing that you can see. And, again, like in seeing it, like, oh, man. I have some appreciation for what ends up being, you know, something in freedom and something in being, you know, set free to, to live outside of the construct of, of those things, you know? So um, it all, it's, it's all worked out just fine. Even if the road to fine has been a little bit bumpy in us getting there. You know, as we start to close yeah. out, our little one always likes to come on and ask yes, a couple questions. Yes, our 10-year-old. Let's do it. Questions. Yeah, he's been on almost every show. So, I'll go so get She's going to go get him. We got a three-year-old that when she gets older, she'll be plugged into the show, too. Love <laughs> this. Love yeah. this. Because yeah, we are a family. You know, again, that's why I wanted you on, too. Because, again, there's a lot. There's red flags that were there that even as we were talking, I saw that, yeah. you know, that would help us. Because, again, we're trying to be um, – the you know the Oprah, but as a couple, you know. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I love it. You know, because there's no, you know, again, when you look out there, you know, you've got a lot of these talk shows, and they're never married. Yeah. And like, well, we want to be that. We want to fill that spot. I was like, I think there's a niche for that. Nobody's doing it, so we want to grow our show to a point where all of a sudden we're there. But at the same time, we also have to watch our marriage. Because we don't want to fall into those traps that other people have yeah. um, while we're trying to build the success together. Oh, who's this stud? Hello. Who are you? Uh, my name's Christopher. Hey, Christopher. How are you, bud? Doing good. <laughs> All right. Hi, Dave. So what's your favorite food? Sorry, say that again? Uh, what's your favorite food? My favorite food, bacon. Ooh, bacon's good, ain't it? Yes. What's yours? Mine is pizza. Yours is pizza. Oh, I mean, I love pizza too. I had BJ's pizza yesterday, as a matter of fact. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so what's your favorite TV show? My favorite TV show right now. I'm watching a. It's. I think this is TV. I'm watching a show called Ozark right now, mm -hmm. and it is a good show. It's on uh, on Netflix. What's yours? Mine is SpongeBob. SpongeBob. My kids love them some SpongeBob. Uh, we've we've seen every episode. I tell you. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, bye. Thanks. Hey, thanks, bud. Nice to meet you. Yeah, we're, he's eventually wanting to do his own little podcast, and, and we're calling it. We already got the domain called Chit Chat with Chris. Love it. And it's going to be like it. a 10 minute thing where we bring on celebrities to chit chat with him. And so oh, you know, it's a fantastic. We're idea. hoping to set that up by the end of the year and all that. That's awesome. So as we close out, what's kind of next for you and what have you learned through this journey? What's next for me? It's such an interesting time. You know, like the this year of a reset for me is as uh, as real as a definition of anything else. Like I am taking. Um, a little bit of a slower pace right now. I pulled away from social media when uh, I rolled into treatment and haven't come back just yet. Wanting to like really understand the way that it's had a relationship in my life, both in positive ways, man, I feel so connected to and grateful for a community that's been there with me through a whole bunch of crazy things, but also the negative ways in that, um, you know, I, when you when they're cheering, it makes you feel good. But if when uh, there's criticism, it makes you not like yourself as much, you got to step away from the thing that uh, has that kind of effect. So I'm stepping back and just doing a little inventory right now on, man, is this good or bad? If it's going to be in my life, how is it going to be in my life in a way that preserves mental health? Um, in the shortest term, I've been working on a couple of different projects with some nonprofit organizations to see if there maybe isn't something in me as a business consultant in my future. Um, it's really great to be able to um, take that integrator thing we talked about and helping build out the Hollis company and apply it into some different places. So wow. uh, National Angels, this foster care organization that I've been doing work with since I moved to Austin. I'm in there working on a five-year plan with their CEO, Susan Ramirez, right now, uh, doing some work with a group called Health One Now that's trying to end generational poverty in third world countries having a conversation with my friends inside of some work around Down syndrome. So um, doing just doing some work in some um, in some nonprofit spaces to see if, man, is this maybe a thing that you might do next professionally, being something of a business consultant for small businesses, yeah. question mark, mm -hmm. not sure. Um, and, and then at the same time, still doing my podcast, still writing as much as yeah. – uh, I'm not sure when my next book will come out. I know next one will. And so uh, this experience <laughs> has brought me plenty of things to write about for sure. Um, yeah. And I've been uh, really, really intru into and in, uh, involved in a, an amazing fitness community with uh, my partner, Heidi Powell. And so oh, wow. we've wow. been, uh, yeah, we've been doing uh, these 60 day challenges that have been yeah. just some of the most incredible. We'd love to have her on the show. Yeah, yeah, no, we got to try and get her on here for sure. Um, and I've just been, you know, Focused on my fitness, my mental, emotional, spiritual awesome. fitness, and uh, trying to make that a priority every single stick and day. Love yeah. That. So love as we it. close out, I'll let Sandy ask the last question. All right. What would you like for your legacy to be? What would you like to be most known and remembered for? The most powerful question. What would I like to be most known for? Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> what I mean, a way to end it, right? <laughs> what, a, what a way to end it. You know, I mean, I'd love for my legacy to be that in some ways the work that I did made someone feel a little more normal in the messier parts of their life. That, wow, I love that. they didn't have to feel like they needed to do more or be more, that they were already worthy enough and beautiful and in, in their eyes and, and in the eyes of God and, um, and, and to like own, Hey, just because you're struggling or because you're a mess doesn't mean that there's anything special or different about you. We're all that way. Um, if I could help <laughs> someone feel a bit more normal, that'd be an amazing legacy to, you know, to leave on this planet. I love that. So yes. tell everybody how they can find your books, you and all that. Well, right now I'm doing uh, a lot of what I do through email and blogging on my website. So if you want to jump over to MrDaveHollis.com, you can sign up for my email. When you get it, sometimes I throw you a link to my blog. If you're interested in podcasts, same place you hear the Chris Sandy Show. I'm sure you can also hear the Rise Together podcast. It comes out on Thursdays. And you can buy my books wherever books are sold. The, the first one was called Get Out of Your Own Way. The second one, Built Through Courage. I hope that you will read them. I'm sure that you will enjoy them. And uh, man, I just, I appreciate you guys. This is a fun conversation. Oh, well, we, we so love much. that. And we definitely enjoyed having you on the show. We and did. we look forward to having you back for more updates as yeah. you go through this crazy life. I love it. I will be back, you guys. Uh, I wish you all the best. Give my best to your kiddos. And uh, I'll be watching. I want to see this thing continue to grow and be uh, as amazing as I know it can be for you guys as well. 
Uh, All right. We, we appreciate, appreciate that. that. Thanks so much for Thanks. your time today. All right, guys. Appreciate you. Bye.